Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 167, which reads as follows. Hi nang dhammang na seweya na pamadena na sangwase mitcha diting na seweya na siya loka vadano. That's the Pali. English is what it means is uh, in English is uh, one should not pursue inferior dhamma, hina dhamma. One should not engage in negligence, pamadena na sangwase. One should not associate with wrong view, mitcha diting na seviya. And one should not be a person who holds up the world, who uh, who thinks highly of the world, basically. Four parts to it. Four things one should not do. One should not uh, associate with base or inferior dhamma. One should not associate with negligence or get involved in negligence. One should not get involved in wrong view and one should not exalt the world. Think highly of it. The story is uh, there's a bit of an interesting story to this. It's not long, but um, again, it, it's hard to tell how it relates to the verse. You wouldn't guess. It's related, but only tangentially. So the the story is of a young monk and an elder who went on alms round in Savati and they happened upon the house of this great lay disciple Visaka. Visaka was one of the greatest lay disciples of the Buddha always looking after the monks and teaching her fellows and practicing upright righteously and keeping moral precepts and so on. Just an all-around wonderful person. There's stories about her as well. And so she would was constantly, it was one of these people who uh, every day prepared food for any monks who went by. And In Buddhist countries you see this happening now that Buddhism has become a, a force and something that's very important in various cultures of the world. You'll see people doing this, uh, putting out food every day. Uh, Wisaka was one of the first people or one of the early Buddhists who gave daily offerings. As the monks would go by her house, she would invite them in. And of course, she was, she was quite rich, so of, of course she didn't every day come out herself. Now on, on this day, uh, and there was uh, her granddaughter was looking after alms. And so uh, the, el the elder and the novice went in, or the, the novice, the elder and the young monk went in. And first they received some rice gruel, this rice porridge that they offer in the morning. And then the elder left and uh, went to get alms elsewhere and left the, the young monk to, to receive alms in this house. And so she, the, this, this young woman, this granddaughter who was looking after the monk, uh, uh, brought out food, I guess, and, and at one point she was straining water because uh, a monk is not supposed to drink water that is not been strained properly in order to 
be sure that there's nothing living in it and that sort of thing. It's just one of those things. It's actually not really clear the... Um, it, it's not especially a, a significant rule in the sense that everyone should be worried about whether you're going to kill um, bacteria by drinking water that's not been filtered, but it was sort of more in order to avoid criticism. Anyway, not terribly important. She's looking in in this vessel that has the filter, the, the strainer in it, right, this primitive filter, and she sees her face. She's just a young girl, I guess, and she laughs. And she's right in front of the monk, I guess, and the monk looks down into it, and he laughs as well. I guess it was kind of funny to, to see the girl's face in the, in, in the bowl. And when he laughs, she looks up at him, and she says, a cuthead is laughing. I, mean, I guess it was surprising to see a monk laughing. She'd had monks come in. Monks, one thing monks aren't really supposed to do is laugh. Um, you know, there'd be a sort of, a, especially in when going in, in and among houses, they have to maintain a certain decorum, a sense of propriety. And so she would have been familiar with all these serious monks who came in and were very quiet and maybe smiled, maybe spoke quietly. But laughing, she saw this monk laugh and she said, a, she called him a cuthead. Somehow she had this, I don't know exactly if there's some, I was trying to find a better translation, but it really does literally mean cuthead. One whose head is cut. Um, it's like a haircut, right? The idea, the point is that he has he's, his head is shaved, but I think it perhaps was as weird sounding to him as it was as it is to us, because you don't ever call someone with someone a cut head unless they actually have a cut and are bleeding or something. Or this literally, this would better mean that someone who had their head cut off, perhaps, but that's not what she meant. And the monk got really angry, and he, he abused her and said, by saying, you are a cuthead. Your mother and father are cutheads too. And he was, he was I guess, quite vicious about it, uh, because she ran off crying and went to see Visaka. She was terribly upset, perhaps worried that she'd said something wrong and feeling just terrible for what she'd said, feeling terrible because the monk reprimanded her, or insulted her, attacked her, basically. And Visaka asked the, the little girl what she, what's wrong, and she told Visaka what, what happened. And Visaka went out and said to the monk, Reverend sir, don't, don't get upset at this young girl. She didn't, you misunderstood what she meant. She didn't mean, um, it, she didn't mean anything bad by it. It's a measure of respect. She. Uh, respects you for having your hair shaved, basically. And the young, the monk says, "Well, that's that. That may be so, but uh, was it proper for the girl to speak this way? Was it proper for her to call me by such a an insult, basically?" So he, he still took offense at it. He didn't have any real um, argument against it. He was, I'd say he was very much in the wrong for attacking this young girl who clearly didn't mean anything by it. Then the el then the, so then they were arguing and then the elder comes in and says, what's wrong? What's going on? And when he heard the facts, he turns to the monk and he said, Apehi, he says, get out of here. That was no insult. You know, a monk who has their hair cut is, is someone who has a, a cut head. <laughs> it's fine. Hold your peace. And uh, again, he, he says, well, what are you doing attacking me? She's the one who, you know, what he, basically arguing that uh, he had done nothing wrong with this young girl. He said, "You, what are you doing calling her, her and her family a cuthead? Well, she called me a cuthead, basically. That's what it seems like. And then the Buddha came in. Somehow the Buddha was on his arms round as well, or you know, he must have come to see Visaka every day, well, or regularly. 
somehow the Buddha came in and said, what's going on here? And Wisaka tells him the whole story from beginning to end. Now the teacher does something, and this is, I think, what's interesting about the story. There's something to say here. The teacher, instead of uh, rebuking the monk, he looks at the monk and he, he, he's, he sees some potential in the monk. And so instead of doing what I would assume would be proper, uh, or you might think is quite proper to rebuke this monk, he turns to Visaka and he says, hey, what's the meaning here? Why, aren't you, why, why don't you admit that? You know, is it proper for your granddaughter, uh, just because my, my disciples go about with their hair cut, to call them cut heads? He turned on Misaka. It's a very interesting. Like again, with these stories, is you can never really be sure how authentic they are. But regardless, there's something to be said here. And the monk suddenly gets uh, feels good about himself. He becomes a appeased by the Buddha's speech, and he says. Only you correctly understand. Only you, you, your wisdom, you know, in your wisdom you see through, you see the truth here. And then, so now he sees that the monk's more at peace, and he teaches him this verse. He says, an attitude of ridicule with reference to the senses is a low attitude, an attitude that is low one ought never to take, nor should one dwell together with heedlessness. And then he spoke this verse. So it's a redirect. The verse isn't actually speaking to the situation exactly. It's, uh, it's something that we see with a lot of these stories and verses. A cynic might say, well, it's just, these stories are just made up, and that's why they don't fit quite well with the verses. But I, that, I think that's a poor reason to think uh, that the verses are, that the stories are, just made up, because that's what the Buddha would do, is he would redirect. It wasn't of concern to him who was right. You know, what's the Buddha interested in this argument, who's right, who's wrong? And that speaks very much to um, what I think is the lesson of the story, and interesting for us, is um, that for someone to become steadied in the Dhamma, for someone to progress in the Dhamma, their mind has to be steady. They can't be upset. You can't be um, full of self-righteous indignation, for example, you know. In this case, this monk was full of anger. And uh, more the anger isn't so much a problem, but the reaction, the, 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 the interaction with the others, the fact that it became an argument, that it became a fight, Right. We have this verse up here on our wall because I think it's quite, um, quite an important verse about how getting angry is one thing, but a person who responds with anger creates the real problem, does the greater evil. And so when this monk was angry, um, everyone getting angry back at him was not the proper response. You know, trying to show him that he was wrong was clearly not working, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't helpful, right? You, they may have been right. They were right, I think, that this monk was in the wrong by attacking this little girl. I mean, he, had, he should have known better. That it's quite curious that the Buddha would, you know, because it's not something that the Buddha uh, insisted. He was much harder on the monks, right? It was much more important that the monks behave and he was very um, lax about trying to um, control ordinary lay people. But in this instance, especially because Visaka was far more advanced than this monk, he, he had no problem because it was a means of redirecting the monk's uh, energy so that the anger would be as, uh, assuaged or... or let, reduced, giving him the opportunity to uh, deeply understand the Dhamma in relation to the situation. You know, there was a lot of um, unwholesomeness involved in the monk's 
state of mind that had to be fixed, that had to be had to be addressed. So um, <clears throat> what that speaks to, I think, is the need for us, again, the need for uh, for the mind to be in the right position, right? You need clarity of mind. That you can't just... That, that it's not enough to attack our defilement. This is why mindfulness is very much about um, observing rather than, than attacking. And what this is sort of speaks to the idea that opposition to our defilements uh, is, is of limited use, if any, right? If you get upset about or try to remove or try to fix your, your mind, fix the problems of the mind, why it doesn't get anywhere, or, the, or speaks to the fact that it doesn't get anywhere. It's important for us to stand, understand this quality of meditation practice, that it, it's about observing and about n neutralizing, really. You know, that if anger comes up, it's not about opposing the anger and getting upset about it. Right? Internally, it's the same as externally. Here we had an external attack on the monk's um, defilements, you know, he was angry. Everybody was getting angry at him, and uh, it just got worse and worse. But as meditators, it's quite—it's—it's it's along the same lines, you know. As meditators, both externally and internally, we have to find ways to neutralize, not attack, not fix. Right? Here's an attempt to fix this monk fix him, he's, he's wrong, right? It speaks to how we should engage in relationships rather than trying to win arguments. Winning arguments should never be the goal. The goal should be fixing arguments so that there is no argument, so neutralizing the argument. There was this... Um, I read this story about a, a famous actress, I think, who was attacked by, uh, was called some very nasty name by, a, by some other person on the internet. And uh, she, it was this interesting, it was a whole news article, how instead of, um, you know, ignoring him or whatever she 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 went in through his his history on his social media history and learned about him and responded back to him uh, with compassion you know talk, understand with understanding and you would wonder well why would why would she waste her time on this guy but it, it, in the end he uh, it's a long story but he he opened up to her and eventually apologized and uh, and uh, she found out he had a bad back and she ended up donating money to, or, or finding him a way for him to get help with his back and just the story went on and on about how they eventually became friends. That it was a really good example of how uh, you know it's easy to it's easy to talk about someone it's easy to label someone and pigeonhole them as being evil and say to yourself, well, the Buddha said don't, don't get involved in, with those people. Let's just pigeonhole them, they're, they're, the, they're the bad ones and let's stay away from them. We want to be good people. Clearly the Buddha didn't do that sort of thing. We have many examples of that. and It's not the best way forward not in terms of our practice, our development as individuals. You know, one of the big things about Buddhism is coming to terms with your karma, which means with your situation in life, whatever, whatever it might be. You know, we're all, we've all been through uh, all sorts of situations. It's not that this situation is somehow special for us to learn from, but it's about gaining the 
the attitude of non-reactivity, of, of objectivity, of equanimity. And so a big part of that is when violence or unwholesomeness comes to us, that we don't feed it, that we don't react, that we don't, we don't contribute to it. So I think that's a, an interesting, is an interesting example of that. Or the Buddha found a way to, uh, again, I, I don't, you know, the story is kind of uh, quirky, but um, clearly the, the lesson is to uh, find a way to appease and, and to, to neutralize the situation. Yeah. The bigger um, teaching here is in the verse itself, of course. The verse, the, this verse, I think, is um, one that we should keep a tab on, maybe bookmark it, in if you're that sort of person, uh, something to come back to in, in the Dhammapada, because it talks. It's a good summary of the four aspects, uh, or four aspects. I'm not sure if it's meant to be comprehensive, but it seems fairly comprehensive. Um, the four aspects of, of unwholesomeness of the problem that we're trying to address you know, the real problem uh, and so the four are Hina Dhamma Hina Dhamma is uh, base things base uh, experiences and this is, the, this is sensuality this is sensual desire the desire for Beautiful sights, lovely, lovely sounds and smells, delicious tastes, yeah, soft, comfortable, wonderful, pleasant feelings. So this simply relates to our desire for these things. We want these things. And the Buddha said, don't, uh, don't go after them. It's quite simple. From a meditative um, Point of view. I think this uh, this one is uh, probably the the easiest and the most clear. But um, what we're talking about with all of these is an answer, sort of, to the question of why we suffer. Right? Uh, uh, we come to practice meditation or or religion in general. It's it's quite often because we're looking for peace. We're looking for happiness. We're looking for some some higher um, or a way out of the life that we live. We're looking for some sort of greatness. Right? Um, you know, we, we, we come with, we, we see the suffering in life. We wonder, why is it? Why am I not happy? Right? Why am I not satisfied with life? A big part of that, so a big part of that is sensuality that uh, we think it, ha it makes us happy. We chase after pleasure. It brings us a brief moment of satisfaction and then it's gone. And if we're lucky, we can keep chasing after it. We can chase after pleasure as much as we want until we get unlucky, until things change. And then we realize what it's actually done to us. That it's made us super sensitive to to the senses to if, if it's visions you see beautiful things then you become super sensitive on the one hand where uh, every time you see something attractive you jump at it you, you become increasingly um, sensitive to to pleasurable stimuli but on the same on, on the other side you can see once you don't get what you want and that's a part of what you see here as meditators because there's very little stimulating how uh, how needy you are for that pleasure when you don't get it how your mind starts to make things up and you become uh, tormented by not getting what you want now, meditation is a lot of discomfort in the beginning 
and the meditator can't get what they want because there's so much wanting. Because our ordinary life is all about chasing after, jumping from one pleasure to another and finding ways. You know, we find ways to live our lives that allow us to engage in constant pleasure by jumping, jumping, jumping. And now you come to meditate and you're not allowed to jump anymore. That's where the suffering comes from. There should be no suffering in sitting still and doing nothing because it's quite peaceful. It's free from so much uh, trouble. And yet the trouble comes from within. Our mind creates the trouble. Buddha said these are base things. These uh, desires that we have are, are base because they create addiction. They don't actually, they aren't some sort of happiness. You know, I had an argument recently about this. Someone was telling me, well, it makes me happy, period. And then uh, I, I said, well, you think it makes you happy, or something like that. I was just sort of idle and, and, and uh, wasn't really interested in getting into a religious or a philosophical or a Buddhist debate of any sort. And uh, the conversation went on, and I I wasn't really involved so much in it. But uh, at one point, they said, uh, "Well, it's not. I don't know how we got into it. It's not black and white." Anyway, I said something, and then this this person got really angry, and uh, stormed off. And uh, the other, another person, someone else, came up and said, "You know that." They're really angry, or they're really upset. I don't know what's wrong. And I was thinking about it. I thought, you know, well, you know, if if it may, if it really, I mean, this is the point. The point is, it doesn't make you happy. These things, this sensuality, doesn't make you happy. That we were, I mean, I'm maybe not explaining it, but I'm trying to be fairly vague. But this person was was basically positing the argument that sensuality, you know, these things, make us happy. Um, and without getting into an argument, because this person wasn't at all interested in Buddhism or meditation, um, the, you know, it was clear to see that they weren't happy. They were they were the sort of person who gets angry easily. I mean, that comes from sensual desire. It comes from uh, things like killing and and stealing and and so on and so on. comes from the many states of mind that that encourage uh, partiality, encourage us to become content only with a specific um, subset of experience, so we be, become dependent on certain experiences. So the first is not to we shouldn't engage in these things. We shouldn't engage because it's inconsistent. We want to be happy, and yet we engage in these things They're not make, that aren't making us happy. We find this is one of the big things about meditation practice. Once you finish a meditation course, all the stress and suffering and then you leave and you feel how peaceful you are. And you, you notice the change. It's like going through withdrawal. And you start to see the difference between seeking pleasure, seeking happiness through pleasure, and learning to be happy. And you start to see how what it means to not find happiness outside of yourself. The only thing that, that we gain from seeking out pleasure is, is addiction, the need for it, and displeasure when we don't get it. So the second thing is heedlessness, or, or I said negligence, right? Negligence refers to lack of mindfulness. So the, um, speaking of pleasure, we can talk about, I mean, as I said, pleasure is something that doesn't satisfy, and when you don't get it, then you're disappointed. 
But uh, the interesting thing about mindfulness, and this, this is what we mean by, by negligence. Negligence means not being mindful, not being aware, not being present is that once you're present, there's really, it's really a non-issue because pleasurable things aren't desirable. There's no connection between a pleasure... This is what we don't... It's hard to understand is that there's no connection between a pleasurable state and desire for it. Just like pain. There's no reason to be upset at pain. There's no reason to be attached to desire. I mean, or to be attached to pleasure. Why do we think one is more desirable than the other? Well, may, may, that may seem hard to understand, but through the practice of meditation, it, it's not even an intellectual thing because you're aware. When you're aware and alert, a pleasurable, n no desire arises based on the pleasurable stimuli. stimuli. And, and, you know, really, if you think about it, that's how it should be. There's no reason for us to desire pleasurable, there's no logic behind it. We say, well, it's pleasurable. I mean, what does that even mean? The truth is it's an experience. Pleasure is an experience, pain is an experience. That we should desire one and, and uh, be averse to the other is actually artificial. And you can see that through meditation as you practice. It's like it wasn't even, it's like it, it, it never even, it didn't ever exist. When you feel pain and you say pain, pain, there arises no aversion to the pain. If you ask an enlightened person, if an enlightened person were to think about it, it would be like, it would be completely nonsensical to be attached to, it would just wouldn't, uh, it, it wouldn't compute that one should desire a pleasant experience. I mean, there really is no argument for it. And it, that's not an intellectual thing to say, that's, a, that's from experience, you experience that. When there's pleasure, you say happy, happy, or pleasure, pleasure. No desire comes. When you see something that normally you'd like that, you say seeing, seeing. No desire comes. There's no reason for it, right? So, <clears throat> and the Buddha's instruction here is to try and be mindful. When he say, in the second one, one should not be unmindful because it's unmindfulness that leads to. It's like being in darkness, or or being blind. If you're blind, you walk around and you bump into things. That's an analogy for what we do. It's not that we mean to do something that causes us suffering. It's we're, we're like we're blind. All of our addictions, the reasons why we get build up all sorts of habits of aversion and addiction, the reason why uh, we become bad people, the reason why we become good people is often just because we're blind, because we're walking around blind, and we. We hear some noise and we think it's uh, we think it's something we think it's this and it turns out it's something else. We're guessing for the most part. We're living our lives guessing. You think about it. Why we do the things that we do. Much of it is just guesswork. We would say intuition sometimes, but sometimes it's just chance. We fell in with certain people and that's why we are the way we are. We learn from each other. We learn from each other, it sounds better than it actually is because sometimes someone will say something and it will be taken uh, as, as meaningful by another person, right? If you see me do something and, and maybe it's something I do and then I, th I think, I feel, oh, that was terrible, I'm never going to do that again, and you see me do it and you think, oh, that person does that. Or we ascribe meaning to, well, we... we we ascribe meaning to things that ne don't necessarily have meaning. We we go around blind. We have very little, basically we have very little um, reason for gaining the habits that we do. I mean, often it's because of 
trauma that we become the people we are. Trauma or, or any kind of intense experience. So, um, I mean, it's very, which is very dangerous, of course, because what does it take to become an evil person? What does it take to become a person who is lost in addiction? What does it take to become a person who is addicted to drugs or, or any number of things? For most of us, those people who don't meditate, it's, it's, it's just chance. You know? Look at those people who are addicted and you say, oh, I'd never become such a person. Or those people who are evil and you think, I'd never become such a person. Most likely in a past life you already were. All of those people. But even in this life, you look and it doesn't take a special person. It just takes ch chance and circumstance. I mean, of course, and karma, but karma is just temporary. I mean, karma is not the be-all, end-all of existence. If not in this life, some future life, we could all become evil, evil people. This is what leads us to desire things that are not worth desiring and be averse to things that there's no reason to be upset about. And gain wrong views, which is the third one. So uh, number two first is not be heedless or negligent. To, to be mindful, to live our lives mindfully is really the best way. But the second part of the, whole, of the equation is, is this uh, blindness or heedlessness. What leads to all sorts of bad stuff. But number three is wrong views. Wrong view is a special type of evil. And we say evil. In Buddhism we say evil and we mean it sort of in a utilitarian sense. Evil is something that causes you suffering. It leads to suffering. That's why it's evil. False well, views are special because the view itself the view itself doesn't um, doesn't make you suffer, but it makes you do things, right? There was, uh, I think Pascal said, uh, if you want people to commit atrocities, uh, what is the word, what, what is it? The easiest way to make people commit atrocities is to have them believe absurdities. Mm -hmm. Not exactly, but it points to wrong view. If you ha if you believe something, the belief in something. Now there are wrong views that aren't dangerous. Like if I believe London is the capital of France, it's not really a dangerous wrong view, but it's wrong nonetheless. My view, my opinion that, or if I have an opinion that um, it's it's warm outside, it's hot outside. Well, okay, we're starting to get a little dangerous because I might walk out in my my robe, my uh, under robes or something. But you see, the, the the inherent problem with wrong views is that they're out of line with reality. And the Buddha talked about several. He didn't. It's clear that wrong view could be is only limited by the number of facts there are which of course is infinite, facts that you can get wrong, but there are certain facts that uh, have a special significance. And the Buddha was quite concerned about only a few types of wrong view. Now there are mundane wrong views, like the view that there is no cause and effect, or the wrong view that there is no life after death, for example. Is a wrong view because they're out of touch with reality. It's just not true. It doesn't matter whether there's no evidence. People say, oh, there's no evidence for rebirth. I mean, I don't believe that, but um, it doesn't really matter. See, the point we want to make, the point I want to make here is that it doesn't matter whether you have evidence. If it's wrong, it's wrong. The question is whether it's true or not. Right? Is it true that when you die, the mind ceases to exist? 
if it's not true, then it doesn't matter whether there's no evidence, evidence or no evidence. You know, science is quite it is clear, is understands this, but but is is adamant that um, the the best way still is to go. Well, first you use Occam's razor to find the simplest solution, and uh, but you go by the evidence, what evidence there is. If we don't go by evidence, it's really hard to know what is true and what is not true. But um, cause and effect is one big one. Um, because a person who doesn't believe in there are consequences of, of their actions, you know, for whatever reason, who thinks that they can just get away with whatever. I mean, really in relation to, to the afterlife, it's very important, because if a person believes that, believes that when we die there's nothing, then all you have to do is, I mean, it leads people to believe things like they can just chase after pleasure eternally, that they're never going to have to face the consequences of their actions. If you don't like someone, just kill them. And if you want something, just take it. It, it there's another, um, I mean, on a much more basic level, th I think this is true that, that to a certain extent, this is what leads pe certain people to do bad deeds, is the belief that when they die, that's it. But on a more basic level, they're also missing the fact that it doesn't actually make you happy to live your life like it's, like, like you're going to die, or that, like when you die, there's nothing. Because a person who lives in such debauchery and lives their life Un uncaring about the consequences is going to build up such a um, unwholesome mind that they won't be happy even in this life. The cause and effect is a big one, karma basically. Um, belief in things like gratitude, the Buddha talked about gratitude, belief that you know your parents are worthy of your respect. For the most part, I know there are certain parents who it's hard to find much to respect about them. I mean, you could argue, hey, they, your mother carried you for nine months, that's something. It's a big something, you know, for nine months. Anyway, for many of us, we, we have had parents who took great care of us. And I see people who have had great parents not give a thought to any sort of gratitude. And I mean, that, that may sound, if you're not a meditator, that may sound surprising that, that we should place any emphasis on that, but it's interesting how as you meditate naturally, this sort of gratitude comes out and you think of all the people who have helped you. You think of all the people you've hurt. It becomes a very strong and very important, without any sort of you know, religious indoctrination. You just start to remember all the bad things you've done and all the good things people have done for you, and you think, ah, i got to go find that person and thank them. And your parents, how keenly you feel, generally, if they've not been terrible, terrible people, the good that they've done for you. Uh, but the most important wrong view is is in relation to the Four Noble Truths. Um, if one has the view that craving doesn't lead to suffering, if one has the view of a view of self, that's another big one, right? One has the belief that there is a self, that there is a soul, that I am in control. Belief in God would be another one. You don't have to get in too much into those. Wrong view in meditation, basically to put a to to to, sum, to summarize it. Wrong view is um, is through not seeing reality as it is. 
So our meditation is very much focused on the eradication of wrong view through seeing clearly. Through the practice of meditation, of course, cause and effect is something you see keenly. Uh, Non-self is something you see quite clearly. You can't even control your own mind, let alone your body or the things or the people around you. Further, you find no soul, no self. And you realize that it's even the wrong way of speaking about things. It's not a question of whether there is a self, or I have a self, or I exist, or so on. Because none of those questions or, or concepts exist in experience. Experience is just moments of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. Any thought about a soul, or a self, a god, has no place in, in, the, in the realm of experience. Um, a meditator looks at the world in a different way. They look at it from a point of view of, of the most basic, what I see, or, or I, there is seeing, there is hearing, and so on. And so they give up any kind of view, really, entirely. The only view that a meditator holds to strongly is, it is what it is. This is seeing, this is hearing. When they see, their view is that this is seeing. When they hear, their view is that this is hearing. And that's it. And number four, Lokavadano. Lokavadano is a special kind of... Uh, well, they're all special, but this is a distinct, distinct from the other three. Lokavadano is someone who holds the world up, who exalts the world, who sees the world as a good thing. So the Buddha um, encouraged his followers, especially his monastic followers, to give up the, the concern for the world, the attachment to the world. We have so many ambitions and goals. If you think of all of the ambitions and goals that we have in the world, some of them are so ingrained that, that we, we don't even notice them. Like our concern for politics, our concern for our country. How's my country doing? Right? Our concern for our future. And by our future, I don't mean in a philosophical sense. I mean our, our, our employability, our... Um, upward mobility are we getting are we progressing in life you know, our status in society how other people look at us how my family sees me how my friends see me how other people see me am I famous am I rich am I uh, am I smart? Am I beautiful? Am I fat? Am I thin? So many things about the world, internally about us and about our position in it. Concern about the environment. The environment's a curious one from a Buddhist perspective because I think the best thing you could say about it is um, it's a sign. The degrading environment is a sign of an increase in greed, an increase in uh, attachment to the world. I mean, we talk about progress. Everyone's raving about the progress of humanity and actually how things are doing better, right? Things like crime are down and poverty is down and, and the things in the world are actually supposed to be getting better. But there's, it's hard, it's, there's this niggling feeling that something's not right there. And the environment, I think, is a sort of a canary in the mine shaft, telling us that I agree. There, I think there might be some really good things increasing in the world. Uh, of course, there's the glaringly obvious uh, evils in the world that seem to be increasing, or at least not going away. Um, but statistically, there's a lot of good things, and and tech, if you look at technology, how it's you know, allowed us, given us power that we didn't have before, supposedly, it seems. But it's curious, it's interesting to think about, is it really giving us power? 
I don't have to I don't have to memorize the Tapindika because it's on disk here. But is that really a power? I mean, the power to memorize the Tapitaka is nearly gone. The Buddha's teaching, I don't think there's hardly anyone in the world who can anymore. We're getting, getting lazy. Um, but, but more to the point here, we're becoming much more physical, much more worldly. Technology is a huge sign that, that we're advancing, but we're advancing in a worldly sense. We're using objects, our objects, our materials. A computer is just material. The internet, it's all made up of materials. And, and we become so obsessed that, that we spend so much energy creating these materials. That's a, I think it's an example. So. Our uh, our our lives become you know and have become very much external. I think technology is a good example. Of course, the Buddha was talking. I think more about things like politics and and uh, society and you know the world, the, the natural world, the cosmos. Uh, one's one's resources like a house and and possessions and so on. Not to get caught up in these things. Not to get worried about them. Um, but I think it all boils down to our our our, our uh, focus. And our inclination. What are we? What are we thinking about? When we get distracted by all these goals that end up being meaningless, that we want to be rich or famous or have this or have that, want the latest iPhone, want the latest computer, want the biggest house and car and so on. Want to be this or that, want to get employed or, or, or rich or so on. And none of this is meaningful in the end. All of our goals, all of our uh, ambitions, they have no meaning. It's not that, um, it's not that there's a problem with, with uh, the fact that they have no meaning. The problem is that we, we ascribe meaning to them. Doing things that are meaningless, it doesn't, you know, there's, there's nothing ostensibly wrong with that. But what's wrong with it, what's wrong is, is seeing them as having meaning and, and thereby getting obsessed by them. So a person who becomes enlightened does very little in their lives. Enlightenment leads you to do very little. Why? Because all of these things that we do that, that makes the world, makes society, why we have society in the first place, because we have such intense ambitions and desires and obsessions. The need for things. I mean, we didn't need an iPhone, right? Until we did. Until our needs became greater. I don't think people's lives were less fulfilling when they didn't have iPhones. But we're, we're going further and further, more and more into the world. We're making the world. Dangerous. It's dangerous because, well, <coughs> the biggest danger of it is that it distracts us. The world distracts us. Distracts us from the problems that we've already talked about distracts us from our addictions, it distracts us from things like anger and, and hatred and the pettiness, and it encourages them. Distracts us from the work that needs to be done to purify our minds. Distracts us from the present moment, from reality. It distracts us from reality because the world is not real. Politics 
you think Donald Trump is a problem? He doesn't even exist. Or this, I shouldn't name specific people. I'm not supposed to do that. But um, there's a lot of you know, everything. I, I was just visiting my mother, and it's amazing. The TV's on all the time, and all they talk about is this one man. It's quite impressive. It distracts us from reality. All of our worries about the economy and the environment and politics and society. Yeah, there's something there. There's something in the sense that other people are engaged in that. And so to relate to them and to just live our lives, sure, you need money, you need society. Don't let them distract you. Don't hold them up beyond a, a functional importance. Yes, you need food. You need money to get food. That's it. You need to live. No money is not something to be strived, stri strived for. Don't hold it up. Don't exalt it. Don't let money be your god or any of these other any other thing like that. Don't let the world be your god. So these four things are four things that this verse tells us. This is the beginning of the loka laga, so it's relating to the world. Loka means world. And it's a good exam a good description or enumeration of the kinds of things that we want to try and get away from and go beyond. So yeah, that was long. Uh, I'm back. Uh, we'll try to have more videos now. Um, but anyway, thank you all for tuning in. And this has been another episode of the Dhammapada versus number 167. Wish you all the best. Have a good night.